So today we have our seminar uh, on the topic of very uh, most uh, up the, uh, interesting topic uh, these days in our field, the structural engineering on the computational simulation of progress of failure of buildings. Uh, will be taught by uh, uh, Professor Sharif L. Tawil uh, from the University of Michigan. Professor Ta uh, L. Tawil received his uh, PhD from uh, Cornell University. Then he went to uh, serve as a faculty uh, uh, at uh, uh, Central Florida University, uh, then moved to University of Michigan, right? Uh, he, is, he is also, uh, he received many uh, awards, and also he's uh, very active in the uh, uh, research field and also uh, committees. So he's uh, currently uh, uh, managing editor of the ASC Journal of uh, Structural Engineering. Uh, now, let's welcome Professor Tawil. Yeah. yeah. Thank okay. you very much, Yan. Thank you. Um, is this working? Yeah, I think. All right. Okay, great. So, um, it's uh, great for me to actually to be here. I, I feel a uh, a strong connection to this university. I was just telling Professor Zhao that my brother graduated from the USC uh, Medical School. Uh, he did a fellowship and uh, he did his residency there. So he's there for seven years. But I never got the chance to actually visit him because uh, it's not, a, I think, a great tourist location to go and see people in critical care. So, But anyway, I've heard a lot about USC. Um, I've never visited this campus, but it's actually much larger than what I thought it, uh, it would be. Um, I walked around today a little bit. Um, the, the topic of, of my talk is progressive collapse modeling and um, other uh, offshoots of that research, basically. Um, since this is a small group, I guess it's very informal, so feel free to stop me at any time and, and uh, we, we can talk about any of the topics I'm presenting. So the uh, presentation outline, um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about my research in the University of Michigan. Uh, the bulk of the presentation is kind of more theoretical stuff leading to some more practical ongoing work in structural engineering, how we do collapse modeling, and these two offshoots, virtual reality and egress modeling, which kind of came out of our work in this area. So this is kind of the general flow of the uh, presentation. So let me start first with Michigan. I don't know how many people here are from Michigan or have visited Michigan. I know at least one person has, <laughs> yes. So Michigan looks like a mitten, um, and uh, Ann Arbor is here. Uh, it's a really pretty town. It's not too big, not too small. It's actually just perfect in terms of size. It's about 35 to 40 minutes from Detroit and from the Canadian border, so we're really close to uh, Canada. Um, and uh, it has really the main employer there is the University of Michigan, but there are other industries, so it's not really a college town. Um, my work is more on the computational side, and this is uh, where my clusters, uh, many CPUs that are running together, reside. They reside in this brand new building, the Michigan Information Technology Center, and this is what it looks like on the inside. It's just a set of cupboards with very good air conditioning because these things generate a lot of heat. Um, so uh, in addition to that, this is our lab, which also I do some work there. And to get a size for the scale, you can see a person here. Bob is a big guy, by the way. Uh, he's a muscular, <coughs> tall guy. So this, these walls are about 20 plus feet. Um, the strong floor is about 40 feet by both sides. And this is considered uh, a relatively uh, medium-sized lab now. My colleague Jim White tells me that when this was built in 1982, this was one of the largest in the country, and then people would come visit, um, see how it's done, and go build a slightly bigger one. So now it's ended up being medium-sized, and I think in a while it's going to be pretty small. But uh, this is a wall that's about, I think, 16 or 18 feet tall, so you can tell kind of the scale of things we can do there. So before I start my talk, um, I'd like to acknowledge some of the sponsors for the research I'm about to present, some of my students and postdocs, and also my collaborators, and primarily Sashi Kunath, who, who, with whom I did a, a lot of work uh, in parallel. Okay. So uh, let me start first with, with scales. And, and if you're trying to model a structure, if I go down here, uh, this is a structural system. On purpose, I drew these figures about the same size. But there's a lot of complexity at all these levels, so the scale of from one, from one tenth of a meter to about 100 meters, you have structural behavior of general interest, basically local, I'm sorry, global buckling of an entire wall of a building, for example. That's the type of response I'm talking about. If you go down one notch from, uh, from one millimeter to about a decimeter, 
Um, you have other types of behavior becoming important, local buckling, uh, local fracture. And if you go down one notch, the micro scale from one micrometer um, to 100 times of that, you have voids and you have the fracture uh, actually initiating at that level. If you go down even some more at the atomic scale, you have slip planes and you have plasticity, the origins of plasticity theory. And you can keep going down, um, down to quantum scales. Um, and the level of complexity is the same at these, all these levels. And there are good models that exist at every one of these levels. But the problem is, how do you actually connect them together? That's, that's a big challenge. And it's not only in structural engineering. This, this problem exists in many fields, um, in weather modeling, in medicine, in chemistry, in chemical engineering, uh, mechanical engineering. The, the issue is that you have all these good models at different scales, but you can't really connect them very well. And so multi-scale modeling uh, tries to get all these heterogeneous models to work together. All right. So let me start with this, and then I'll jump more into structural engineering down the line. Now, the way that scales are linked in all these different fields is that um, the information from the lower scales could be used to drive models at larger scales, so through calibration or statistical models. Sometimes sub-modeling, if you know what this means, is in, in finite element codes, this exists. All right. So one model kind of drives, is, gives you an idea of what the bigger model should be doing. So you move on to the bigger model, and then you keep going up the scales. And the more sophisticated kind are coupled models, where um, you couple them all together. They, you do one simulation, but everything is working together. But this is difficult, and it's very time consuming. And some examples of that are what we call global local formulations, where in finite element fields, for example, you have the, 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 the shape functions are enriched with local conditions uh, or local fields. And um, it becomes a, a little complicated. Or homogenization, where you could use averaging techniques and to get um, um, behavior that is a local level at the global level. Or if you do it in a very rigorous way through homogenization theory. But, but these are the various ways that people take care of this. So in structural engineering, um, these are the scales that I'm going to be talking about today. Structural scale models. Um, some examples are lump plasticity, distributed plasticity, fiber section models. Maybe some of you are familiar with these very well. Um, at the macro scale, you have 2D and 3D continuum models. And at the micro level, we have these micro mechanical models. And I'll be talking about kind of along this range here. There are smaller scales that are of interest, but I'm, we, kinda, we couldn't actually handle them. It just became so complicated. So this is the focus of my talk today on that side. Right. So basically, um, I look at fracture, ductile fracture, which we deem to be very important for how a building will collapse, and how that leads into local behavior at the connection and member level, and how that uh, uh, feeds into structural response, and how that eventually causes this vicious cycle to go on until a building collapses into a rubble uh, pile or basically stops and reaches equilibrium. So kind of this is, again, the scope of my talk. So let me start with ductile fracture. And uh, ductile fracture, um, when, you, w when you take a piece of steel and subject it to triaxial stress conditions, so stresses along the three axes, um, there are little impurities in steel that are usually carbides. And as the stresses increase, basically these carbides either break or there is uh, decohesion ar ar around the surface of these uh, uh, little particles. And these voids start to basically grow. And then they grow some more, and eventually they coalesce into a crack. This is how a ductile crack starts in a, in a steel member. Uh, this is different than brittle fracture, where you have an existing flaw that kind of propagates. Uh, this, is, this would start even if there's no obvious flaw in a piece of steel. And this is what we theorize ha happens uh, when a steel structure collapses, basically. So a lot of this takes place. Now, Gerson, in 1977, proposed this very interesting model that is called porous plasticity. And um, it's where uh, you have a matrix full of little spheres. And these spheres grow uh, in a nice, coherent way. And then they join together once they reach a certain condition to cause um, a condition um, that will essentially he will interpret as um, fracture. But the problem with the Gerson model is that it assumes nice round spheres, but in reality these spheres are never round. And under certain conditions they be can become elongated, but not spherical. And so this model would not work well if you have shear stresses or what we call deviatoric stresses. And so we had developed an, a different model, a continuum-based model, that is um, in a multiplicative plasticity because very large strains are involved. And um, I'm skipping a lot of the equations because I, I mean, I can slow down if you want me to. I'm trying to get to something else which I think you'll find more interesting, but I need to lay the background for that. Um, and this model is based on, on continuum damage mechanics, where instead of using a real stress, we use a, what we call an effective stress. And this stress is a function of a damage index. And this damage index is tied to the growth of these voids, how fast they grow. 
And the growth of the voids is controlled by a set of, of plasticity rules. This is from classical plasticity theory. There's nothing really innovative here. But what is innovative, and in the previous slide, this one, um, you would see this in a plasticity class. But what is different is this damage function, which has a set of components that are related to microstructural behavior of steel. So this first part pertains to void elongation. So the void does not necessarily have to be a sphere. It can elongate if it wants to under deviatoric stress. This is related to stress triaxiality. So the more stress triaxiality, the, rap the more rapid damage will grow. And uh, when the voids grow too much, they coalesce into a crack. And we can capture that. So this damage index is what captures all of this um, together. And to show you the flexibility of the model, um, by changing the parameters, we can capture no damage, which is this is uh, true stress strain behavior, so it always rises. Or at some point, once the voids nucleate, they start to grow, and eventually a fracture happens. So it's a very flexible model in this respect. And even though the variables um, may, have no phys may have no meaning uh, as in terms of as variables, they do have physical significance. And um, we did some modeling and some testing to try and calibrate these models. Um, and we, g we got some some good results with that. Now, what I've just described is essentially a coupled um, micro-macro model. So we take the voids, we relate them to the behavior of a crack. So that's where the multi-scale modeling comes into play. But that's not enough to model an entire structure. And so this is where the other level of coupling takes place. Uh, I'd like to um, introduce here how we modeled um, the uh, sub-assemblage, for example. Now, this approach of putting springs and rigid members is well known. This is an earthquake engineering. People do that. Uh, they've done that for the past 25 years. But really, not too many people have done it with collapse modeling. So in a sub-assemblage here, we, we consider this is a column. This is the connection, what we call the panel zone. Is, its behavior is represented by the spring. This is a beam. And the connection itself between the beam and the column is these springs and this member here. This spring represents contact between the connection uh, between the beam and the column. And uh, this here represents the shear tab. And this represents the concrete slab. Excuse me. Yes. Why no dash pops? Because damping is not a significant issue here. These things happen very quickly. And so damping is not a significant issue. Is elastic? No, a spring can be inelastic as well. So it's inelastic? Yes, it could be inelastic. And it can separate, so you have nonlinearity from that too. All right. So to, to, to recap what I just described, um, we have coupled models that link from the micro to the macro scale. And then we have uncoupled models because we use these models to calibrate what's happening here, linking from the lower scales to the higher scales. So this is kind of where, where we are right now. And this is kind of was of our objective. Okay. So the main part of my talk pertains to pro progressive collapse. And, and this more theoretical work was, was just setting the, the background for what we have done. So progressive collapse. This term has been used a lot, and I don't know if, you, if it makes sense to you, the word progressive. It means it's just progressing. But yes, exactly that's what it is, is that the collapse is not arrested. It just keeps going until the structure fails. All right? So basically, it has a very formal definition, is when you have a total loss of the structure due to a small loss of a part of the structure. So for example, you take a building with 100 columns, you knock one off, and the building collapses completely. That is not acceptable. But unfortunately, that's how buildings are built now. Um, they have this type of weakness in them. Um, and, and sometimes you can think of it as a house of cards. People have used that word as well. But progressive collapse pertains to, to this phenomena. It is a multi-scale phenomena. That's why we were forced to go into the multi-scale direction. It is a dynamic process. There are things knocking on one another and, and adding loads, and there are dynamic effects. And it's really interesting that research on progressive collapse has proceeded in waves after high-profile attacks, basically. So each wave lasts about five to 10 years, and then it kind of dies away. And the last wave is actually, I think, has peaked. And I think it's on its way to dying. So anyway, the origin of progressive collapse studies um, came from this famous building. This is a 22-story uh, building that is built from concrete panels. And there was an explosion on the 18th floor uh, due to a gas tank. It was not intentional. And basically, it knocked away uh, some walls. And when that failed, the the failure progressed all the way from the top to the bottom in this quarter, uh, in this quadrant of the building. So that's why they called it progressive collapse. But Ronan Point is really the origin of progressive collapse research. Okay. Now, if you look at what's happened in the 1970s after Ronan Point, people dealt with progressive collapse in a qualitative sense. Um, make your building well connected together. Make sure it's ductile. Make sure it's redundant. 
uh, those type of terms actually exist up to now. Some of the current codes have these terms in them. Um, but in the 80s and 90s, as computational tools became stronger and so there were more experimental results, people started to quantify these qualitative issues. And basically, they did some structural modeling. They did some um, fracture tests and things like that. And finally, now after 9-11, there has been a lot of research ongoing in this area. But as I said, I think the wave is starting to go away in terms of um, in, and, and giving way to other more contemporary topics. Like, anybody care to name some of them? Sustainable construction, yeah, uh, things like that. And so I, until something else happens, and then this become, I think we'll put this again, you know, to be, become important once again. <coughs> All right, so what are the mechanisms that essentially resist collapse in a structure? Well, there are three that we can define very clearly. There's catenary action, which is really the big part of my talk today. And catenary action is once uh, this column goes, the building goes down, there are tensile forces that happen here. And these tensile forces, they, the name comes from a catenary of a, of a chain, the sh shape of a chain under gravity loads. It's not really, it doesn't look exactly like that, but people have used this term frequently. And these loads support the member and prevent it from collapsing. Um, there, there is also virine deal action, which is the entire frame around the local part here, supporting loads. And uh, there's also these non-structural elements that provide struts that carry some load as well. But really, the last line of defense is catenary action, because once these go, uh, we consider this to be of primary importance in collapse resistance. Um, you can imagine that after 9-11, there, there was significant effort within the uh, structural engineering community to develop guidelines to uh, build uh, structures that are resistant to collapse. And so there, there's a lot of them. But what is really interesting is that at the time, and even up to now, um, there are no mainstream design documents that deal with progressive collapse, like the IBC or the UBC or any of those. They really, all they have is make your building ductile, make, it, um, make sure that it's well connected together, and all of that. Very general uh, recommendations. But um, government documents are much more advanced, like the General Services Administration in 2003, and uh, this is a DOD document, Department of Defense, the uni uh, Unified Facilities Criteria, have very explicit criteria on how to build a building to make it resistant to collapse. And there's a lot of committee, within, committee activity within ASC, AISC to try and, and go in this direction. So if you take all these documents and, and boil them down into what should be done to prevent progressive collapse, there are there's very limited design philosophies that are available right now. They fall into two categories, direct design and what we call indirect design. And in indirect design, you make sure there are minimum levels of strength, continuity, and ductility. We call these pers pers uh, perspect uh, prescriptive provisions. Uh, you may remember this from earthquake engineering. That's what it was like in the past you know, 30 years, although that's changing now into performance-based design provisions. Um, this was developed by British engineers after the uh, Irish um, uh, the people from Ireland, there was a lot of, maybe I, I don't want to get into political discussion here, but there was a lot of bombings due to the Irish Republican Army. And so they developed this method, which is, they call it the tie force method. And basically the idea is make sure that all your structural members can take a certain tensile load, enough that if you lose a member, you have enough tensile capacity in all the members to support the load, this catenary action concept I talked about. Now, the direct design method is more interesting, and this is really where my talk would be going today, is the specific load resistance method. Make sure that members uh, that are um, vulnerable are strong enough to support the load. Like if, if you're in a hotel, make sure that the columns that are uh, visible to the public are strong enough. If someone comes in with a backpack filled with explosives, they don't disintegrate the column, for example. This is not very practical, because you don't know how many backpacks there will be and how strong they will be. So the alternate path method is really the most important. And it just makes sure that there is enough um, redistribution ca capability in the building to redistribute the loads once a member is lost. So if you lose this member, then make sure that the rest of the structure can carry the load. Okay. So the, the question with which we got funding, all of this is known and, and, and really this, this question was how we managed uh, to convince funding agencies to give us money is, will seismic detailing lead to better collapse resistance? And in the 70s and 80s, people said, you know, seismic detailing is great. It's good for seismic co um, conditions, but it will also do well in collapse resistance. But there was no evidence 
to make to to support that statement and so that was the basis of our research really and we took this building that was designed by the National Institute of Standards and Technology and uh, it was a seismically designed building and we studied its collapse resistance uh, as part of a larger study in which uh, myself and there was another faculty member involved as well we were dealing with steel structures and they were dealing with reinforced concrete structures and if you notice this is a this is a building that was actually built for uh, Los Angeles and um, it has this uh, very distinctive design where the moment resisting frames are on the outside all right and the rest here is a gravity system okay it's just thin columns going all the way down okay and some of the seismic connections we looked at WOF W is welded unreinforced flange with a welded shear tab so basically it's welded here and here and the shear tab is welded all along RBS is where they cut off a part here to look at to make it look like a reduced beam section or the, some people call it uh, affectionately a dog bone connection some of you may be familiar with this term. And this is a shear connection used in the gravity portion of buildings. And as people do in earthquake engineering, my background is really in earthquake engineering too. And so we took a sub-assemblage here and we studied its performance under pushing down loads. No one had really done this type of uh, pushing action on sub-assemblages. Um, and, uh, and so we took it and assumed that this had lost a column and we pushed down on it. And we sub gave it uh, sufficient support course we didn't we couldn't do that we wanted to start with that before we went to the entire building to understand its behavior and then we pulled out some of the multi-scale models I talked about because fracture was so important to us um, in this case we could use the Gerson model or the new model that I presented uh, and um, in the regions where we expected the failure to happen we localized our, our meshes there so this is just um, a simulation I like you to note where fracture initiates and how it propagates. Um, so we're pushing down up here, and remember it's being supported at the ends. You can see some very nice lateral torsional buckling taking place on the on the beam, the lateral beam, and fracture is going to start somewhere here and then just propagate up very quickly. And and basically this, uh, we we use these to study the behavior of the subassemblages and then move them up to the another level, to the structural level. And um, our research partner was NIST, and they conducted tests similar to what I just showed. This is, again, a beam here, another beam here. This is a column stub. If you look up there, can you see the actuator? And uh, these beams are, they have the same type of support that I showed you for the uh, numerical scheme that I uh, pictured that I was just showing. And um, the idea is that if you push down here, you should develop sufficient tension force and study what happens in these connections. All right. And they did these tests at an ERDC, the Engineering Research and Design Center uh, of the Army, because they had big enough actuator to do this. These are very, you need very large forces to be able to push down on these connections. Um, and as a result, this is a numerical simulation of the test. You can see that the fracture is climbing up at the reduced beam section. Same thing was observed in the test. This was done before the testing, um, and we saw that here as well. We compared between the model and the test and same failure condition, same general trend is happening. And I guess the innovation here, people have done a lot of uh, connection tests, but the, the innovation is that the test is done with very large tensile forces acting on the connection. That is what is different uh, than what has been done previously. Right? And you can see that this climbs up, and that's due to the catenary action. Most connections, if they, are, if they didn't have this tension component, they would yield, go horizontally, and then soften. This doesn't have the softening action. This came about from our, our local fracture studies that I showed from the multi-scale scheme that I talked about. So the fracture parameters come from there. Well, in this case, this is the big test. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, to get it from the, from the model itself, yes, we had some coupons, and we got the parameters from there. And actually, the mesh itself is dependent upon the, the parameters, <coughs> dependent upon the mesh because of the softening. And so we had to calibrate it for the particular size that we wanted. This is for the other type of connection, which didn't have a reduced beam section. And um, if you look at the bottom here, the fracture happened at the toe of what we call the axis hole. This is the axis hole here. And again, the fracture initiated here and uh, went all the way through, which is what we were essentially seeing as well before the test. Um, does anyone know why you have this axis hole here? This is in earthquake engineering. You need this axis hole for? Make the weld. Yes, to be able to put in the weld stick on this side and weld here and then go to the other side and make the weld continuous. So it's a necessary evil, but it introduces all sorts of weaknesses in these connections. Um, 
In any case, um, so with that, once we were comfortable with our models, we went to our structural scale models. And I had showed a picture of this before, um, but I didn't show, I guess I'm showing it again because we compared to some test results. We wanted to make sure that our results are giving um, a reasonable, um, uh, are reasonable compared to test results. And so these are a set of results by Professor Astani Aslet Berkeley. And this is our model here. Um, these individual jumps here are failure of bolts. Okay. Um, this is the structural scale model for a beam column connection. Um, they, they look so simple, and indeed they are. It's just it all, it's all in the calibration parameters. Okay. And um, the calibrations were actually also very straightforward. Um, using our multi-scale modeling scheme that I had introduced earlier, we had a set of numbers that we use to give us to mimic this behavior that we're interested in modeling, basically. Okay. And just to show you, um, if I take this subassemblage, um, which is, has, has a, had about a couple hundred thousand elements, it runs in a day, and it gives us this dark black line. Uh, and if I run it with the structural scale model, it has only five or 10 elements in it in that range, and it runs in a few seconds, we get some pretty good response. Uh, even at the level when you're looking at the catenary force, again, it, you have this, uh, it mimics this climbing action very well. It goes and it fails at the same point. So we felt very comfortable with our model and also with the speed that it gave us because we can't um, spend a lot of time modeling just one building and put all our effort into that. So we have to have models that we can um, um, extend from. And then we took s certain buildings, uh, blew out various columns, and studied their behavior. These were seismically designed buildings. Um, this is a situation where we had local failure here. Um, we looked at the forces in the various columns and, and in the various beams and the catenary action that took place as well. Um, this is another building where failure did not happen. There was a lot of inelastic behavior. There were plastic hinges forming here. Uh, there, were, there was um, uh, shear connection that had some damage as well. But as a result of all of these, so we had... I was just say, what kind of uh, connections were you using on these analytical models here? Were they the reduced beam section or the um, standard old... And in, in this um, SDC, this is a seismic design category C. Uh, this is a building that was in, in Atlanta, so this had the welded unreinforced flange. But there were in the set of buildings that we did, we had some that had reduced beam sections, and some that were that were um, that had that did not have them. So we had both types. So we did probably 30 to 50 of these simulations, covering the various types of connections and design uh, um, schemes that we had. And the, and the simulation requires how much? This one, um, it's relatively fast, but when I say relatively, it, it has a meaning. It, it takes about four or five hours on a, on a machine with several CPUs. All right. uh, otherwise, it would take much longer. And I'll show you one of the much longer ones in a little while. If you take an entire building and modeling, model it, how, how long that takes. I'll talk about it in a minute. So as a result of all the simulations we did, um, we came up with a set of findings. This is not the end of the talk, by the way, just so I, I don't want to get your hopes up. There's still some more. Um, that seismically designed buildings um, are indeed um, ductile enough to deform in catenary mode, meaning that you can develop this very high tensile forces in the beams. All right. However, that's a function of some other research variables we were looking at, the shear tab behavior, the beam depth, the yield to ultimate stress ratio. But the interesting thing is that the seismically designed buildings um, are less vulnerable, are indeed less vulnerable to collapse, as people have been saying. But our findings that it's not less vulnerable to collapse because of the detailing itself. It's really less vulnerable to collapse because of the layout of the building. You have these strong um, frames on the outside, and these frames are so strong that if they lose a column, it's not really a big deal. It's not because of the ductility due to the detailing itself, which is expensive, to cut the access hole in a certain shape and to put in special welding requirements. That is very, very expensive. Do you know that welders make more than most engineers? So. Yeah, so you don't want to use too, mu too much of or too many of these people. And so the ductility demands are really rather small. And the advantage of using s ductile seismic detailing is not evident. So it's kind of a contradictory um, a finding that we are finding here. Um, one other thing, APM is alternate path method. I showed you as one of the design philosophies. You should make sure that the building can sh shift the load around if it needs to. And that it is useful for judging the ability of a system to absorb loss of a critical member. But when you are close to collapse, it's not that useful. It can tell you it's close, it's going to collapse or not. But what if you are very close? What if your load is off by 10%? And if you add that 10% with the building collapse, whereas this method would tell you not? So it's kind of misleading. You have to be very careful when you use something like that. 
So in our quest for finding out ab about this ductile detailing, whether it's use useful or not, we devised something called push-down analysis, which is very similar to push-over analysis in earthquake engineering. So in earthquake engineering, you push on a building and make sure it has enough seismic resistance, and you investigate its behavior. And so we said, OK, let's push down our buildings and kind of see what happens. And so our finding was, yes, that seismic detailing actually does have some benefits. If you use the reduced beam section, the, um, the reduced beam section actually fractures, and it shields the rest of the building from collapse. We did see that. So it acts as a structural fuse in the case of collapse. And, um, and I, I think this is a very important uh, finding that we, we had there. However, when we went to the intermediate moment frames, the SDCC, which was designed not for the highly seismic zones, um, we found that some of the columns were actually buckling as we were loading the entire system down. And buckling is bad because uh, it is very sudden. There is no reserve behind it, and the entire building just collapses. Um, it's not a realistic loading scheme by any means. It's just to investigate the weaknesses in the system. But that was our findings in this particular case. Um, another big thing we're looking at are 3D effects. Um, they're actually uh, really interesting and very complicated. Um, if you take a, a two-dimensional frame, this frame here is actually the front of the building. All right? And if you load it, in a, if you knock out a column, we knocked out this column, the building basically collapsed. This one knocks into this one. In the end, the building totally collapses. However, if I, take, if I remove these columns here, um, the building, because of the slab action, does not completely fail. There are some local failures, shear tap failures. This thing drops maybe two, three feet. Imagine you're standing on this, it drops two, three feet, but we'll be safe in the end, hopefully. Um, so the three defects are very substantial. And most people don't go to these models because of the computational expense that is associated with them. This model runs in, in almost 10 days on, a 20, on 24 CPUs, so it takes a lot of running time. So to include 3D effects is, is not easy, and, and yet it has such a profound influence on structural behavior that it cannot be ignored. Okay. Luckily, it's on the conservative side. Uh, that's what we've found so far. Um, also, another interesting um, thing that we're finding, I'm sort of picking some of the interesting things we found, is that if you take a, a slab and um, you only model, I'm showing four panels around so you can see two bays by two bays. If I take this column and take it all the way down and I knock out the column here, which I'm showing like this, then actually the entire system fails. All right, this is in the gravity portion of the structure. However, if I take it as part of an entire floor of a building, so uh, and I knock out one of those columns, it doesn't fail. Again, the slab action from the surrounding system kind of supports it. So 3D effects are very, very substantial. Kay. And that's one of the, our ongoing work and that we're working in this area. And just to show you what the simulation looks like, these columns here are going to go. That was the only way we could get the entire building to collapse. I'd like to draw your attention to this frame. Notice how it's swinging in. Uh, it's swinging in because of the slab. So the slab is actually pulling the building in and causing it to implode. Slab is, is very influential in this case. So this is kind of what I wanted to show you on the structural engineering side of things. And I have two more topics, as I mentioned. One is, is urban search and rescue and the use of virtual uh, reality. Just a couple of slides. And the other one is on egress modeling. Again, also a couple of slides. So I don't know if you have any questions for me. Yes, we were using LS Dyna, but with modifications, so with user defined models. Yes, this, yeah, yeah. So the software generates the movie for us and allows us to do the simulation. In your first model, that's uh -huh. a micro model, smaller model. Yes. Smaller. Yes. Uh, how did you, is, is that the, the time dependency included? No, there's no time dependency, not in steel. So years, there's no time, the strain rate effect is not No, strain rate effects are actually quite low. They're at the seismic level. And so the entire collapse takes place in 7 to 10 seconds. So the strain rates, when we looked at them, because that was an issue for us, it is so low enough to ignore. Yes. At the moment of explosion, strain rates are import important for the column that is blown away. Okay. But once that is removed, yeah. then the, for the rest of the structure, it is not an issue. Okay. 
Yes. Uh, you, uh, you show them that always it starts in the ground floor, right? Yes. Uh, is there a way that you can remodel on any other floor so that perhaps collapse of entire floors can happen in a pancaking? Yes, that is a, uh, that's what we're currently doing right now, okay. but I didn't have anything to show. But we're looking at failure uh, happening at upper floors or and interior columns too. So th that's of interest. So let's say you take, uh, not right now we've looked mostly at columns on the perimeter. But if you take a car filled with explosives and blow out a column in a garage, for example, at the lower level, on the inside, not on the outside, what happens? Mm -hmm. And as well as upper floors. Yeah, I'm yeah. a electric engineer, so yeah. like a, those kind of damages sometimes on the middle floors. Y yes. And it's like, <laughs> you cannot yes, do anything. of course, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's an issue, too. Yeah, so let me, Jim. Short question. Yeah. Does uh, LS9 then handle multiprocessor processing, or do you have to do something to it? Uh, yes, it does. It does ha handle parallel processing. There is a problem when you use user-defined models, you cannot use the multiprocessor. And so in many cases, we are kind of stuck and, and had to use either the native models or to just wait it out. And that was sometimes frustrating, when, especially when you used uh, user-defined models, because it, we wanted to do things that it couldn't do, and so we had to uh, program them. Um, we were, this was run on, on Opteron nodes that each uh, 12 nodes, these are relatively old now, so actually they're obsolete and we're kicking them out and getting something new. But each node had two CPUs and there are 12 of them networked together. Okay, and Opteron is, these are AMD uh, units. And now we have something called Istanbul nodes. This is our new system that is also built by, built by AMD. Okay. And actually, you know, when you look at it, I don't know how much you know about uh, new m uh, computer technology, but when we look to buy new systems now, uh, they don't come with two nodes. They're coming with six and even 12 nodes. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, 12 CPUs on each node. And they're becoming a lot cheaper. So our first cluster was about $45,000. We're getting double the speed for $5,000. So it's dropped how many times? You can figure it out. So uh, moving on to uh, USAR, this is Urban Search and Rescue, and it has a very close relationship with uh, collapse because basically most urban search and rescue happens in collapsed buildings. And this is a, a picture from an earthquake. Uh, this guy is really lucky that he was stuck in a void, that he was able to, to be pulled out. Um, and in fact, about a third of all victims rescued are found in stable voids within collapsed structures. And this was the premise of our research, is if we can do collapse modeling, then can we actually try and find the voids in there? I'm not sure that we were fully successful in our objective, but as far as I know, it was one, one of the first engineering studies of, of, of void formation. Um, and also, the survival chances, if you know where the voids are, and you can sort of predict where they are, then you can go in, uh, w in a targeted way, rather than just you know, go in the perimeter and look for people that might be calling out. Uh, because survival chances decline very rapidly with time. Although you've heard all, all these miraculous stories of people being found 10 days after the, you know, the collapse. Um, there, were, there were two research objectives. There were social dimensions of s search and rescue and engineering dimensions. And we wanted to know where people were and how they thought and, and how they, you know, investigate, how they uh, survived basically and their relationship with SAR operations. And on the engineering side, we wanted to use state-of-the-art simulation technology to look at collapse and possibly develop training tools that help, help search and rescue personnel um, and help them understand collapse mechanics too. Um, we can do everything. So on the social side, where some of our social science colleagues at the University of Delaware, they have something called the Disaster Research Center, which is a really interesting concept. And this was done um, at the University of Michigan. Um, so our idea was to visualize the collapse well, then uh, that that could help a person who's uh, not a technical person understand how collapse happens. And so we used the finite element simulation for collapse modeling. But we implemented our results um, um, in virtual reality, in a virtual reality uh, environment. Maybe you played virtual reality games, but basically what it is is you wear a head-mounted device that has two screens in front of your eyes. Um, on your head, there is a sensor that tells the computer which way you're looking. And basically, you can go inside the finite element data, and you can look around, and with a joystick, you can actually fly through, back in, and out again. And, and you can play, play with, the, with the simulation as if you're playing a game. Okay. So this software was, ri was written in um, VRML. It was written as a Java applet that essentially can be loaded on any browser. So you can go to my web page and, and download that if you want to. The code itself is there, too, if you have any interest in, in changing it. Um, but it's, um, it's a set of commands that interact with one another 
that could be controlled from this Java applet to allow you to, 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 allow you to view the simulation in a virtual reality setting. Um, if you see it on a web page, you will only see a 2D view of it. So you need the 3D glasses in order to see it in, in three dimensions and look around. Okay. But to show you what it, li it is like in, uh, in, two di um, in two dimensions, this is what you would essentially see. We're going to ride on this thing here as if we're on a spaceship, go inside the building and look around. Um, you can see the columns, the beams. Um, there's an impactor that should be, well, uh, I guess this is before the impact. So you kind of kind of see what's happening. There's the impactor. It's, it's on this side. And it's going to fly through and knock out a couple of columns. Okay. There's a little synchronization issue, you know, with research codes. If you get it working, you don't worry about these small details too much. But, but, it, but, it, but it basically it went through. I stopped the simulation, basically, to allow you to see what happens. This building totally pancakes down. And um, let me just run this again. There's some really nice views of lateral torsional buckling in the beams, uh, local buckling in the columns, leading to global buckling as well. So it's, it's a great research uh, and, and teaching tool. And then you, you can, I mean, if I allow it to pancake, you don't see too much because all the slabs come on top of one another, basically. Um, another research area, this is a new project, also again with another set of, of social scientists that we are working on, is if we can model collapse, um, and then what would people do in a collapse situation? If you feel enough vibration signals, you run out of the building, can you get out on time? But this is not just mere curiosity on our part. We would like to tie uh, outcomes of collapse with, uh, and this is very elusive for earthquake engineering, uh, we'd like to tie the outcomes to uh, actually people essentially dying or getting hurt in a, in a building. So if we can tie the performance of the building to an outcome like this, then I think this is the holy grail for a lot of uh, research areas. In earthquake engineering, you have this so-called life safety, but that's not ever been well defined, or collapse prevention, again, never well defined, although it's more defined than life safety. But in this case, that was really our objective, was to try and to reach some objective like this. Uh, this project is just started uh, starting. It has been funded by NSF, and it's going to continue for another three years. But we've made some progress that I'd like to show you. So we model people as these three uh, circles. And th this represents really the shoulders, the torso. Each person can move in a certain way. You can run at a certain speed. You can turn at a certain speed. Um, you cannot occupy the space of the person next to you. You cannot run through a wall. You, um, basically uh, don't have too much thinking at this point. This is our thought process. Although we're going to make this a lot more sophisticated when we uh, work with our social science colleagues. Um, but, the, the simp but the thought process right now is very simple. There's danger, you have to run, you go to an exit. Um, taking these rules into consideration, basically. Um, there's, a, there's a mind to this. We call these agents. Each agent can think a little bit um, and look for a target and can, can move in a certain way. So I'll show you two simulations, um, which we used to calibrate. This is 100 people trying to get out of a small door. You can see them aggregating here. They are kind of, they move, they're moving back and forth. They're trying to get out, basically. Um, you can see this is taking a lot of time because the exit is so small. And in some of our simulations, they actually got jammed here. And they just didn't go anywhere. But they, but they do get out. Now, if you notice what's happening in a larger exit, and basically, things are a lot smoother. It's a lo they get out much, much quicker than in, than in this case. All right. And essentially, we really didn't care about this too much, other than the only reason we did the simulations was because we wanted to compare to existing data uh, and other software that can do this that were calibrated to real results. So in this case, um, we, could, we could program our agents to behave in an aggressive way or in a passive way. Aggressive mean, meaning they get very close to the person in front of them. And passive is they leave some space in front. You know, it's not an emergent situation. So if we all leave from here, and we're in the United States, we leave a certain gap. You know, it's somehow socially we, we agree that this is a sufficient gap. However, in an emergency, we'll all be pushing one another to get out of there. In India or China, the gap may be smaller or bigger, depending on, on the setting of the country itself. And so you can do some very interesting things with codes like this. And so we just wanted to make sure that we were bending known results in, in situation like this. And then we can put all, all of our agents in a, in a real building. And this is where we are right now. We can put them in a building like this. Um, we can have them run. Each of them has a stochastic um, 
behavior, meaning some of them are aggressive, some of them are not very aggressive, some of them can bypass others. I think you, if you look in this area, you'll see one guy, this guy here is very impatient, so it starts to accelerate and go in front of this guy and cuts him off, and then they all run to a staircase. And our next step is to put these agents in a collapsing building model to kind of tie them to these performance criteria that I was thinking about. Um, but we haven't gotten there yet, so this is what we will be trying to do in the near future. Yes, agents? yes. This, this was written in, um, in Java, basically, yes. And uh, we wrote uh, equations uh, for their motion and their interaction and the walls and every, everything, basically. So basically, they're, doing this, well basically, they're searching up four directions, but they're to look at the most, uh, let's see, the key issue is to find the shortest way to, 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 to go. Yes, taking into consideration that there are other people running and that there are physical uh, obstacles, yes. And, um, and our next step really, this is just preliminary, is to give each person a mind so that they can prioritize and think about things and, uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that is structured and that satisfies social science rules. That's where we're dealing with our social science colleagues. Because, yeah, because the theory is that people become basically animals in a, in a panic situation and everybody just runs out the door. But our social science colleagues tell us otherwise. They tell us people are very calm. They help one another. If there's a group, if there's a person and, an, and a married person, they go help one another rather than each person running out. If they're kids, you grab them. So we're trying to get these new rules into place and, and put them within our simulation. Uh -huh. This guy presented something. Oh, from okay. People who stayed in uh -huh. the emergency situation in the subway. Yes. Updating yeah. the topic. Yes. <laughs> in between, we have the Moscow bombing. Uh -huh. But the guy presented something very. But it's a, he, he, he's one just like a circle, uh -huh. a sphere. Not yeah. A sphere. Doesn't have a shooting. <laughs> there are some. Um, people have been doing some of this research for the past, past about 10, 15 years. Um, but, but most of them are at the level of what I showed, is, which is very simple panic-based behavior, which is you don't think about anything else about, but getting out of the door. Yeah. Our point by which, again, we convinced the sponsor to support us yeah. is to the social yeah. science aspect, yeah, the social science aspect of things. So, yeah. so anyway, let me summarize. I'm, I'm all done. And um, I talked about the scale issues and and uh, the various scales that are involved and, w and why we went there. We really didn't want to go there, but we were somehow forced to do that. Um, I talked about ductile fracture and how that leads into collapse issues and the, the modeling of connections using macro models and then the highest scale level, the structural models. Um, we looked at system response. And then I introduced two separate topics, urban search and rescue and egress modeling. Um, these are ongoing right now. I just showed you some ideas about what we were doing. And kind of this summarizes everything. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, um, to answer them. Thank you for your attention. You. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, redundant systems, uh, if they have more redundancy, it seems to work better, right? Uh, if, if the column collapses, then the rest of the structure take, can take care of the... Yes. Of the, of the Is there... Is it like a good equation to design structures against the explosion? Is there any negative effect of producing a structure that's overly redundant? I think if a, uh, let me not call it over redundancy, but too much connection within the system is not good. That's what we're finding out. So if the slab is too strong, for example, it's basically causing the building to implode. But does that mean it's better to allow part of the building to collapse by itself and leave the rest intact? I, I, d I don't know as well. These are still open questions, but it's just an observation on our part that the 3D response could be very influential. In some cases, it is causing the building to not collapse, but once it goes beyond a certain threshold, it actually allows the collapse to happen in a more catastrophic way. Mm -hmm. So what is a good balance between those two? This is, I think, something that codes and society will have to decide. I mean, right now, these are just our preliminary findings. In yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yes, it's, some, it's something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be related to engineering that 
Yes. Yeah. But this is more c complex, though, than earthquake engineering in that there's this threshold. Once you pass, too much continuity is not good, is that it allows the structure to completely pull itself down. Whereas initially, before you get to that threshold, it is good. So that's why it's, I'm saying it's more complicated than earthquake engineering. Your model does have a fractal fraction model. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. Okay. If you, yeah. No, this is this is based before fracture, before ductile pr fracture becomes dominant, the model de degenerates into a regular plasticity theory. Um, the issue here is that you want members to separate, and the only way they will separate is through uh, initiation of fracture. That's why we went into the fracture direction. Yes. Now, when when you say conventional fracture, you probably mean the linear elastic fracture mechanics, which is brittle fracture. And this is very different than this. Brittle fracture is where you have a crack and it propagates through uh, the structure. And, and, and here, you can have a crack forming without the initiating flaw. And that's what we call ductile fracture. And in earthquake engineering, the similarity is where you have low cycle fatigue and you take a, you know, uh, a pin and you bend it back and forth until it breaks. This is the kind of fracture we're talking about. Can you also know those kinds of cyclical, low cycle fatigue, cyclical models? We have not done that, no. Not, that was not our intention. But uh, I can see that this could be extended at some point to do that, yes. Uh, another question. So before the fracture of this particular model, before mm -hmm. the fracture, yes. so we can simulate, before the fracture, actually, the existing model can also work, right? Yes, so yes. Uh -huh. So we can do the same job. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think of back to the connection, the subassemblage, like the frame that you will be doing. If you didn't have fracture, you would not really get an interesting result. It would just load to a specific point and stop. But the fracture is what allows the failure to propagate and happen. Yes. The video that you showed us with the output of Palestine, I'm just wondering if you <coughs> ever compared it to, did you have buildings of that size, at that size and blow off the columns and you actually saw that that was the mode of failure or it was it just the software output and just assuming? Um, no, we don't have, we don't have buildings that, that lost columns and that people investigated them. There are a few cases that are known. Uh, to the community. The military has been doing a lot of these testing, but they don't share results with us, unfortunately. And so we don't have specific results that we're comparing to. Um, but we have a lot of confidence in the models because of the way we carefully built them up step by step. So this is where our confidence comes from. But in taking a 10-story building, knocking columns out, and seeing what happens, um, no, we, we haven't. Costly. Yes, it's extremely costly and very dangerous too. There are people who have done some tests, but in the end, usually the building never really collapses and you know, you just drops a little bit. And with most models, will give you good results for that. Okay, but that's a good question. Yeah, because yeah. I'm yeah. dealing with yeah. a similar software, and it generates mm -hmm. really nice output. Mm -hmm. But people always ask, you know, how yeah. did you verify, for example, the yeah. share of free surface, yeah. um, how it changes? You know. Yeah. Yes? Yes, go ahead. In your modeling, uh, did, the, did the beam end near to the collapse column fail first or the far end of the beam end fail first? Uh, the near, the, you mean in the, for the subassemblage? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it happened near the loaded column. You mean the near end fail first? Yes. But uh, to me, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> because when the column collapses uh -huh. and the grab loader will, will, ablate, will be ablated to the beam end, do you, you mean, do you mean, let me see if I understand. Do you mean this area, whether this failed first or the other extreme yeah, end yeah, failed? The other end yeah, the other end of the beam. Yes. Because yeah. that's, that's like a flat tip yeah. to load, yeah. load to the beam. So uh -huh. it, it looks like the, the far end of the beam should have failed first. <laughs> not, not, yeah, not necessarily. The far end actually yeah. has some flexibility from the surrounding uh, structure, but yeah. the lower end is almost like a, if you can look at the curvature, yeah. It's highest there, yes. It depends actually on, the, on how you grab the far end. So if the far end is connected to a column that is relatively flexible, the column itself will deform first before the connection deforms too much. 
And so it sort of shields the connection a little bit. But if you just grab the end of the column, the failure may happen there. In ca some cases, we saw simultaneous failure at the far end, in the middle, and the near end. Yeah, especially okay. if the beam is gravity column, mm -hmm. or if it's a uh, mm -hmm. seismic beam. Yeah. So that may make some difference. Yeah. It, it does depend on the far end uh, subassemblage and how it's held in place. Yeah. Yes, of course, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. No, we did not. We did not put residual stresses. Um, it is possible to put them in, but we we did not include residual stress. It is yes, but it's. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that they would be very important because in the end the fracture is based upon stress triaxiality and very high plastic strains. Uh, in association with this stress traxiality. So by that time, um, there's a lot of yielding that has happened, and any residual stress effects would have been taken care of. Although with brittle fracture, that may be very different, and that's, I think maybe that's where your question is coming from. Still issue on the left of the yeah. left of that fracture. Yeah. So the, when the mesh uh, determines itself, uh -huh. where the fracture will initiate, it's uh -huh. pretty much related to where the original residue stress is. Um, for for brittle fracture, that may be the case, but for ductile fracture, we didn't think that it was, yes, it would make that much difference. Yes, because there's a lot of yielding that takes place, and that eliminates really the effect of residual stresses. Okay. It may have an influence, but we, I don't think it was, um, in our case, it was worth the effort to try and, and put it in, in place, into place. But it may, it, like you're right, it may have some influence. Yeah, Andrew, I also have a suggestion. Maybe yes. In most conditions, the, when explosion occurred to a building, maybe the, there will be some fire induced. Yes. In the yeah. So then uh -huh. the, te the high temperature may, may, have, may have an impact on the behavior of the steel material. So if you consider that. That is definitely true. And uh, fire is an issue we've, thought, we've thought about. But fire, solving fire problems has, um, is complicated in another direction. Now, we, we're using something called ex explicit simulation schemes, meaning it's an explicit in, uh, integration algorithm. Now, explicit algorithms use very small time steps to achieve what we want, and so they give us basically the type of answer that is very suited for this type of purpose. With fire, which may take two hours, you will not be able to use explicit schemes, so you will end up using implicit schemes. And implicit schemes have all sort of instabilities associated with them, which will make a ti this type of analysis almost impossible. Uh, I know that there are some people who are doing fire analysis, but they use um, alg algorithms and things that are different than us. But you're right. I think fire is the logical next step to this. But I'm not sure that a blast is always followed by fire. But so uh, that's yeah. yeah. Fire mm -hmm. it itself it can mm -hmm. also generate. Yes, it can generate the uh, same type of thing. Yeah. yeah. Can the model also use to create the temperature? No. <laughs> no, we, we, we can't, because the, the problem, yeah, yeah, because the problem is, again, is this implicit scheme which will lengthen the analysis time significantly. So we need to find another way to do things, not like what I showed. So not in the near future <laughs> for us. Maybe I have uh, one more question. Yeah. So I, I think in the market there are a lot of uh, uh, computational mechanics programs like, uh, like uh, Page Piston, uh -huh. Adina, whatever, or even uh, Ansa something. Why, what, what made you choose the... LS Dyna, on what yeah, basis? Yeah, yeah. Um, because we, we've been using it for many years. We're familiar with it because we already have uh, user-defined models for it. So that ca sort of kind of makes us stuck to it. We cannot go to other ones. But yes, there's, there are several other options that are available. But for those, we'd have to take whatever we developed for LS Dyna and change them into to work for this new code. I think the, the new versions of yeah, existing software can do this because they're all explicit schemes right now. LS Dyna is probably the most famous, and its oh. origin is really for car crashing, car crash uh, research, which is what we've used it for as well. Um, but I think other codes can now can do something similar to this. Yeah, Abacus, the Abacus Explicit Abacus. could probably do this. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your attention. And also, this is the gift from the department. Okay, <laughs> I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Yan. And, uh, and, and the pen, probably. Thank you, thank you, Yan. Thank you very much. Thank you.